share. On Saturday evening, uh, as people were sharing the verses, we knew that the Lord was speaking to Vista Hills Church. And so I asked if we could have the two verses put in some way where we could mount them on the walls and remember what he said to us. And so, uh, first of all, he spoke through young Daniel, through Psalms chapter 46, verses 1 through 3, which says this, God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. And here's the word that the Lord spoke to us. Therefore, we will not fear. Time to put away fear, church. It's time to be a, to stop being afraid of your shadow. It's time to have the courage to stand up and declare your affiliation with Jesus Christ and his kingdom. It says, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging, still we will not be afraid. Amen? Let us take the word that the Lord has given to us and let us obey it. These will be mounted somewhere out here in the hallway. Please stop and take a look when you can. Uh, Chris Garza um, and Charlie put this together. And then this was the word that the Lord spoke through Scripture through Chris Garza. He was very clear to us that day, his mandate to the church. This is from Psalms 107, verses 1 through 4. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Listen, let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story. I had been tr struggling trying to get the redeemed at Vista Hills Church to stand in front of the congregation and speak of their Lord. And he kind of called us out on it. Let It says, let the redeemed of the Lord tell those their story, those he redeemed from the hand of the foe, those he gathered from the lands, from the east and from the west, north and south. Let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story. Amen? only one thing, according to scriptures, worse than hearing the word of God and forgetting it. That's hearing the word of God and not obeying it. Right? So we want to make sure that we obey. Would you turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 7, please? And let me uh, say happy 4th of July, happy birthday, America. Let's uh, look at Luke chapter 7. Beginning in verse 24, Luke 7, verse 24. When John's messengers had gone, that's John the Baptist's messenger. When John's messengers had gone, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who are dressed in splendid clothing and live in luxury are in king's courts. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messengers before your face who will prepare your way before you. Let me just pause for a moment and uh, let us turn our minds and our memories to this person, John the Baptizer. Let us consider him for a moment. I know that you're thinking about picnics or maybe fireworks tonight, but let's just turn our minds for a moment to that biblical figure, John the Baptizer. We're going to look at a couple of passages of scriptures about him, but one of the things that we can say about John is that he was solely committed to the work that God had given him to do. John, after he was born, we'll see in just a moment, we'll read the scripture that tells you this, but after he was born and after he had got old enough to where he could make his own way, instead of going to college, Instead of 
getting a career, instead of finding a company or going to work for Walmart, John walked out into the wilderness and he stayed there. He lived in the wilderness. He did not buy at Walmart. He did not uh, have a, a Facebook account. He did not uh, um, go to the movies. He did not have Wi-Fi. He did not have a Netflix account. He did not have any of the things that we have. He went into the wilderness. He walked away from the villages, and he lived out in the country. I mean, if you want to talk about preppers, this guy was the first one. He ate locusts and wild honey, and he dressed in camel skins. And he stayed there, doing nothing but waiting until the Holy Spirit that was within him prompted him and said, Now, John. And he stepped out of that wilderness, and he began preaching the kingdom of God and the king of the kingdom of God. And the people began to flock to him, and he preached nothing except the kingdom of God. He didn't get involved in any politics. He didn't get involved in the Sadducees or the Pharisees. He did not get involved with, the, with the, any of the things that were going on, the Herodians, the Zealots. He didn't get involved in any of that. He steps out of the wilderness and begins preaching one message. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And he prepared the people for the coming of the Messiah, and on the day that the Messiah revealed himself publicly, John was there and pointed and said, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. And he baptizes him. And John's disciples begin to follow Jesus, and John fades off into history. He goes to prison, and he is beheaded because of his preaching. That's John the Baptist. Now, here's what Jesus says of John the Baptist. First of all, he says, did you go out to see a guy dressed in rich clothing or soft clothing? No. Did you go to see a circus? No. What did you go out to see? Went out to see a prophet, a spokesman for God, a person who boldly spoke the word of God no matter what. That's what we went out to see. And we heard the word of God. It was a crazy thing. I still remember we we all left the village and we walked out to this little creek, the Jordan, and there we stood and here was this man that comes walking out of the desert and he started preaching and something stirred inside of my heart and I felt guilt and I felt fear and I felt sorrow. And John preached a sermon of repentance, and he said, any who would repent and be ready for the coming of the Messiah, walk down here into the water with me. And I, I found myself doing this thing that no one had done before. And now I, I had seen, I had seen the, the, the ceremonial cleansing in the temple, but this is a whole other thing. This is an immersion in the River Jordan for the repentance of sin. And I found myself Getting in line, I'm going down to the river to pray. Going to get washed in that good old way. And I walked to John and everybody was looking and my mind was saying, what are you doing? You're going to get wet. But the Spirit compelled me and I came. And I went under. And he lifted me up. And I felt forgiveness of sin and I was ready. I was ready for my God, whatever he called me to do. And I just hung around the river day after day. I'd go home and we would talk about what John said. And we opened the Bibles and we'd look to see, when is the Messiah coming? What will it look like? And we talked about it around the table. But every morning we went back out to the river. And we listened to John preach day after day. Oh, it was amazing. Life was so simple. Only one thing mattered, the coming of the Messiah. And then I was there the day that this man, dressed in a simple one-piece home-woven garment, approached the river and suddenly John stopped his sermon 
And he, he paused for a moment as if he was hearing a word from heaven. And he turned and looked, and his mouth dropped open, and worship was all over him. And his hand rose, and his fingers shook as he said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. And before I knew what had happened, I was with the crowd as we began to leave John and began to follow this simple man from Nazareth because no one ever preached as he did. And then I was there the day that John's disciples came to Jesus and said, John has a question, Rabbi. John has a question. Are you really the one that we're all waiting for? Or do we look for another? I was there and Jesus was opening the eyes of the blind and the lame were getting up and dancing as it said they would in the scriptures and the mute were able to speak and lepers came forward out of the crowd and he touched them and he healed them and he looked at John's disciples and said, you go back and you tell John what you've seen. You tell John, don't let anybody be in doubt or be ashamed of me. And after John's disciples left to go back to that prison cell and comfort John with the message, Jesus began to talk about John the Baptist. And he said this, For I tell you, among those born of women, none is greater than John. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Let me ask you something, friends. Right now, you do a quick evaluation of yourself. Are you in the kingdom of God? Uh, I see not. How did you get there? How did you get in the kingdom of God? What did you do? You heard the sermon, right? You heard the message that Jesus paid for your sins on the cross. You heard the message that whoever would believe in him, that he would give them eternal life and that he would forgive their sins. Amen? And you were baptized just as we saw here. And the Holy Spirit, when you received Christ, the Holy Spirit, took up residence inside of you. Amen? And you became the very temple of God. Amen? Jesus says of you that you are greater than John the Baptist. Do you believe that? Jesus said the least little Jordan that we just baptized is greater than John the Baptist. Now, I didn't say that. And you didn't say that. Jesus said it. And all we can do, we may not understand it, but we must submit to his authority in speaking truth. Amen? So if he says it, it must be true. And there's not a way to equivocate it away. There's not like fancy Greek words here or anything that we can you know, say, well, he doesn't really mean this. He's talking about you. That you are greater in the kingdom of God than John the Baptist. Well, how can this be? Well, first of all, John the Baptist was preaching before the kingdom of God came upon this planet. John the Baptist was alive and preaching before the cross. He was still in the old covenant. John the Baptist had never taken communion, nor had he ever sang, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. He has none of the things that you have. He did not have the scriptures that are in the New Testament, nor did he have the New Covenant. You, friends, are greater than John the Baptist in your awareness of the purposes of God. There is no excuse. In your empowering by the Spirit of God, the presence of God in your life, it is there. There is no excuse. You have more than John the Baptist ever had. Now, in this same passage of Scripture that I just read from you, I stopped 
at verse 28. Now, I want to go on to verse 29. And it says, When all the people heard this, and the tax collectors too, they declared God just, having been baptized with the baptism of John. What, what is that all about? Well, when they went to synagogue, the rabbi said, what were you doing down at that river? Don't you know that there is only one way to be in God's favor, and that is to be born of the Jewish nation? Don't you know that you can't get baptized into the kingdom? Don't you know there is only one way to satisfy God, and that is by keeping the Sabbath? and the Ten Commandments. Don't you know? What are you doing? What is wrong with you? And they began to wonder. The tax collectors are just going, I don't know. I just know this. Under your law, I was condemned. And under his preaching, I found grace. I don't know. I know that circumcision left me outside. But the preaching of this prophet and the declaration of the Messiah brought me near to God. And so when Jesus says, I want to tell you guys, you know that guy that you guys came to the river, that guy that baptized you? He has my seal of approval. The tax collectors and the people said, hallelujah, because the synagogue leaders were, were telling me no. Hallelujah, God is good. My salvation is true. And the preaching has been affirmed by Jesus himself. One more verse. I left off at verse 29 with the tax collectors and the people. Verse 30 begins with the word, but. However. The Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the purpose of God for themselves, not having been baptized by him. The Pharisees and the lawyers rejected God's purpose for themselves. Some think, they say, you know what, it was God's will that the Pharisees rejected Jesus, otherwise there could be no cross. The Pharisees were just doing what God wanted Except this passage of Scripture does not say that. This passage of Scripture says God had a purpose for them that they rejected. Do you see that? Look, look. I don't want anybody to think I'm making this up. Right there, verse 30. Again, you can't, be, you can't equivocate this away. God had a purpose for these Pharisees and these lawyers, and they had the ability and the will to reject his purpose purpose, and they did. I don't know how that fits theologically to what people are thinking. All I can do is go by this. A fellow asked me yesterday on the radio station, what seminary did I go to? I confess to you, I did not. I went through life. Hard, hard life, and I found a Bible, and I read it. And I began to study. You know, the Bible shines a lot of light on those seminaries. Not opposed to it. The least in the kingdom of God is greater than John the Baptist. We have everything that we need. You have all that you need. You have a Bible and the Holy Spirit, and I believe God has a purpose for you. Nothing else is needed except your willingness. Let's take a look at John the Baptist for a moment since we began with him as an example. Turn in your Bibles back to Luke chapter 1. Let's look at the purpose that God had for John the Baptist. Luke chapter 1. Now we know that John's father was a priest and his name was Zechariah. And it was time for Zechariah, it's his turn, to serve in the temple. And he was back there uh, doing the things that priests do. 
in the temple. And all of the people were waiting outside because the people didn't go into the temple. Only the priests did. And it says in verse uh, uh, 11, And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. Now that's all they wanted. They just wanted a kid, a normal kid, with bicycles and skin knees and science fair projects. Go to college, get married. That's all. Elizabeth and Zachariah just wanted a boy. Well, they got one. They got one with a purpose. It says, uh, verse 14, You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord. He must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. That was God's purpose for John. Well, let's see how he did. Look at the end of the chapter to verse 80. That was God's purpose for John. Let's see how John did. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. Single purpose. Nothing else is added about his life. Everything that the Lord spoke through his messenger, the angel, everything that the Lord said would John would do, John did perfectly. He fulfilled his purpose. But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected God's purpose. Well, well what was the purpose that God had for the Pharisees and the lawyers? What was it that they failed to do. Just turn in your Bibles, please, to Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15. There's a discussion going on. The Pharisees are there, and the Pharisees are saying, uh, Excuse me, Jesus, why don't your disciples wash their hands ceremonially before they clean like us Pharisees? What is wrong with your disciples? Why are they so unclean? And Jesus answers and tells them, uh, uh, verse 10, he called the people to him and he said to them, Hear and understand. It's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth. This defiles a person. Uh, Jesus, why aren't your disciples clean? Um, excuse me, Mr. Pharisee. My disciples are clean because they're following me and their desire is for God's will and the kingdom. Their heart is for righteousness and justice. They've repented of their sins and they are, they are seeking the kingdom of God. The question is, Mr. Pharisee, your hands are clean, but why is your heart so filthy? He says it's not what you take in, it's what comes out of the heart. And he says uh, in verse 12, the disciples said, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? He answered, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind guides. And if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. What were the Pharisees supposed to be? The Pharisees and the lawyers, those who had the word of God, we're supposed to be guides for the rest of the people, guiding them to the heart of the Father. Jesus said, 
You place heavy loads, you won't lift a finger. He says this to the Pharisees. You won't lift a finger to help them. He says you stand in the doorway and you won't let anybody come into the kingdom, but they're pushing past you. You're supposed to be the guides. What does he say to Nicodemus? Aren't you the teacher of Israel? And you don't understand earthly things? The Pharisees had a purpose. They were supposed to have been the ones who led the children of Israel to the Messiah. But instead, they declared him to be false and taught the people to cry these words, Crucify him! Crucify him! Let his blood be upon us and our children. That's where the Pharisees led the people. They rejected God's purpose. Well, let us consider for a moment, please. This is the birthday of the United States of America. And no matter what you think, there is something very unique in all of history about this country. It is beyond reasonable explanation. When uh, George Washington spoke at the at the, the successful conclusion of the Revolutionary War, as he's speaking to a new country that has just been born, he said, it was almost a miracle. Something was unique about this nation. They call it the Great Experiment. How does a little group of colonies come together and defeat the greatest naval power and the greatest empire the world had ever seen. England at that time, Great Britain, had an empire that the sun never sat on. It made Rome look like a kindergarten kid. And a bunch of backwoods, rustic, uneducated hillbillies won. Almost a miracle, George Washington said. Of course, people were praying. Something unique happened here. And in fact, after the United States of America declared its independence and fought for its freedom and became a nation unlike any other in the world, a nation where the people ruled themselves through a republic government, other countries looked and said, we can do that too. France kind of messed it up, but they tried. They just had a bloody revolution that became atheistic. Canada, New Zealand, Australia. They followed the pattern. And as the world saw it, an artist in France created a giant statue saying there is something about the United States. And they placed it in the harbor at New York but she is not looking inward with the light saying, everyone come. It's not a statue about immigration, although the poem was added many years later. And immigration is fine. I'm not saying it shouldn't be. It's who we are. Hallelujah that there's a place people can come. But the statue was facing Europe, exporting liberty. The statue represented this. This country is exporting something the world has never seen before. We went through a civil war to purge ourselves, or God purging of us for the sin of slavery and the blood flowed and the dollars poured and our wealth just went down the drain in that war as 600,000 Americans plus died. But when the liberty in Europe was threatened in World War II, the United States exported military personnel and weapons and stood for the liberty of our friends across the oceans. And in World War II, the United States packed its greatest wealth, its young people, put them in uniforms, trained them, and sent them off, and they crashed against the beaches of tyranny, and they died in droves, but they won. And Europe was freed. 
under Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher. All of our wealth was spent in an arms race in order to bankrupt the opponents of freedom. Something is different about this nation. Which causes me to say, what purpose does he have for us and have we rejected it? There was something special about John the Baptist. Unlike any other child born and the word of God came and said, here is his purpose. And he fulfilled it completely all the way to his death. There is something special about this nation. How it is formed and how it is born. It's beyond just human explanation. The question is, what was his purpose? in the birth on July 4th of the United States of America. Now let us suppose for a moment that we were able to bring liberty and democracy to North Korea, to Cuba, to Venezuela, to every nation on earth. Let us suppose for a moment that through our, our education and through our military might and through our standing for liberty, we were able to bring freedom to everyone and they could all vote. And they could all get what jobs they wanted and no one was owned by anyone else. At the end of the day, do any of those people go to heaven? You give them physical liberty, but what humanity desperately needs is freedom and liberty from sin and death. Isn't that the purpose of the United States? Three great evangelical revival swept through this nation from coast to coast. People wept and repented and received the commission of God. And our young people and our old people got on ships and carried the gospel of Jesus Christ across the planet. And we brought true liberty and true freedom to the masses. Are we fulfilling his purpose now. There are some during the age of manifest destiny when, when it was believed that God had called the United States to be the new Israel. And just as Israel, like a flood, had gone into the land of Palestine and slaughtered everyone, we were supposed to, too. Manifest destiny. We were to be God's people. Well, what does God's people look like? I'm not very well educated, so I can only look to scriptures. In the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, where I find God writes a description of what his people will look like. Ephesians, chapter 1, starting in verse 1, he says, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. And walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. I want to tell you right now, before we go any further, I believe strongly in being an equal opportunity offender. I'm going to make half of you mad right now, but the other half, hang on, I'll make you mad in just a minute. I've heard people say, I just don't understand how you can be a Democrat and be a Christian because of the abortion issue. And on the other side, they say, I just don't understand how you can be a Republican and be a Christian. One thing that Christians are supposed to be is loving, generous, hospitable, giving to the poor, letting their wealth flow. We look at social programs and we understand that they don't work, but you need to get this. The people that are for the social programs are doing it out of love. They say, look at my poor neighbor. Now, they don't give their own money, they give yours, but still, there's love. 
There's love. Do you see that? Uh, you can puff up and you can say, well, now wait a minute. I, I just don't believe we're supposed to give anybody anything. I'm glad our Heavenly Father did not have that attitude. He saw our need, and he met it by giving his son. He saw a welfare case when he looked at me. And he gave his son freely. We're supposed to be like him and walk in love. But then, the other side of the coin, let me just upset the other half. But sexual immorality and impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you. The other side says, how, how can you vote for same-sex marriage? How can you vote for, for these obviously scripturally immoral positions? The people of God do not have sexual immorality or impurity, or covetousness. Not even a hint. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk. You tell me, are we a Christian nation? Let there be no foolish talk. Okay, that goes like three hours at a time on any particular radio station. <laughs> No crude joking which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that's greed, folks, that is an idolater and has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Now let's just give you another fact to see where we're at as a nation. I'm an American. But we don't match that. We used to. Anybody know how Hollywood originated? Originally, it wasn't Hollywood. Originally, it was Hollywood. A Christian developer said, let me build a community where believers in Jesus Christ can come and live the Christian life together. Hollywood was the original name. Today, it's Hollywood. I think that pretty much encapsulates where we were and where we are. So now, I can't change the nation. I cannot change the nation. We can vote and we can fuss. We get to vote once and then fuss every day after. Put our hope in the next election maybe. Maybe put our hope in the Supreme Court. Put our hope in the filibuster. Put our hope in the orange man. I don't know much, but it says this in the same passage of Scripture. In verse 7, a direct commandment to me. Therefore, do not become partners with them. For at one time you too were in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. God bless the United States. More importantly, God save the United States. But until then, as for me and my house, we will walk for the Lord. And we will be a light that says, this is what a Christian life looks like. And these are the blessings that come on a Christian life. And our family will export the gospel and hope of Jesus Christ. And hallelujah, we don't have to cross oceans anymore to reach those in darkness. They live on the same street with me. I live 
wrap up now with this question. Is that his purpose for you? I think the answer is yes. That's his purpose for you. You were born again for that purpose. Now you're left with the choice of following the Pharisees and rejecting God's purpose for you or following the tax collectors and the people and saying the Lord is just. The Lord is good. I will walk with the Lord and obey his commands.